Morning, please. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 10. I had the opportunity last week to uh, watch our live stream, which is a little unusual to, to be an observer of <clears throat> our service, but it was a great blessing, and I appreciate all that everybody does. And it is good to be home. Let's go ahead and stand, please. Mark chapter number 10, and we're going to begin in verse number 32. We are, of course, just working our way through Mark's gospel on Sunday mornings. Mark chapter number 10 and verse number 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized withal, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to him, to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him. And saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And let's pray. Father, I am thankful this morning that, for the most part in my experience at Westwood Heights Baptist, the subject matter this morning has been very rare indeed that you have blessed us with a sober-minded, biblically oriented people. Father, these are your words, inspired by your Spirit. They are instructive for us. They are corrective for us. If we are guilty of this, or whenever we are guilty of it, they rebuke us and When we are endeavoring to serve, they guide us into the right mindset. And I pray, Lord, that this would be the mindset that we have today, your mindset about our service. And I pray this for us in Christ's name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. It is, of course, the prevailing opinion of the world that people are basically good that what they really lack above all things are adequate resources 
that given enough food, enough education, enough money, enough opportunity, enough encouragement, they will all reach their full potential, which is virtually boundless. The Bible holds no such illusion. The Bible describes us in animal-like terms frequently. Not even animal-like terms, the lowest terms. We are described as fleas, worms, dust, which is not an animal, I realize that, and ashes. The Bible regularly exposes our sordid hearts. And these hearts are found in even the best of God's servants. In this case, in our text this morning, two of the most prominent men in all of the New Testament, James and John. These are Bible writers. These are martyrs. These are apostles. And yet, and I'm going to have you look at two other references within a brief span in Mark, in which Mark, under the inspiration of the Spirit, lay side by side for us the sacrificial nature of Christ and the self-ambition of good men. Look back, if you would, at chapter 8 and verse number 31. Verse number 31, here is Jesus. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And here is the sinfulness of the apostles. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter grabbed a hold of our Lord and Master, his Lord and Master, and began to correct him for this heinous instruction. Jesus, of course, would have none of that and likened him to Satan. And then chapter 9, and verse number 31, and we see it again. Joined together. Verse number 31, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying. Here's the selfish ambition of the men. Peter rebuked Jesus. This isn't going to happen to you. These men, verse 32, understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked him, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Jesus is talking to them about Calvary. He is talking to them about injustice. He is talking to them about verbal and physical abuse. What are they discussing? Which of the twelve of them reigns supreme? And then our passage this morning, where once again the Spirit of God joins together for us in this close proximity the great difference between the way Jesus thinks and the way mere mortals think. Verses 32 and 33 and 34 are Jesus' explanation once again of what awaits him, of what he will experience. They were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went up before them. And what we have here, folks, in verse number 32 is a very emotionally charged passage. In other words, we come to the passage and we ask ourselves, we have two words there that are really given to us without explanation. They were in the way going up to Jerusalem and Jesus went up before them and they were amazed. 
they were amazed. And, and Jesus went up before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. What in the world is going on? Mark records no enemy, no threat. He doesn't even discuss a thronging crowd. I think, folks, that what Mark wants us to understand is that it is the demeanor of Jesus that has these men on edge. That as Christ is approaching Jerusalem, and all that is about to actually befall him is made known to him, and as it is imminent, it changes the way he actually looks and behaves. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 7 says, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Unwavering, totally committed, no backing down, no second guessing, no second thoughts about what is going to happen nor his willingness to experience. Luke 9.51 tells us it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So I would suggest, I think it's, and it's not just my opinion, it's the consensus of most who write about it, that it is the appearance and the demeanor and the determination of Jesus that has these men on edge. They are marveling and wondering about what this all means. And Jesus begins to explain to them once again, as he has done in chapter 8 and in chapter 9, what will befall him. They are close to Jerusalem. They are in the suburbs, so to speak, of Jerusalem. Probably about as far from Jerusalem as Omaha is from Council Bluffs. So we are, we are there. It is going to happen. This is, this is past just talking about academic conversation. The time is at hand. And Jesus then explains to them in great detail what is going to befall him in verses 33 and 34. The Son of Man shall be delivered into the, unto the chief priests, and scribes. These are the leaders, the government officials. This is like being handed over to the, to the court system. And they shall condemn him to death. They shall find him guilty. We know it's a kangaroo court, but it really doesn't matter. He will be condemned to death. <clears throat> And then he will be delivered into the hand of the Gentiles because the Romans can convict him of a capital crime, but they cannot execute him. They need the help of the Gentiles for that. And these Gentiles at this particular point in time are the Roman government officials, Pilate, Herod. They will issue the edict that will result in the crucifixion. But it will not be the emotionless, dispassionate execution of a criminal. This will take on the air of a carnival or a circus. They will mock him. They will play with him is the idea. They will toy with him. They will make faces at him and ridicule him. And they will beat him, scourge him, and they will spit upon him, which to this day and even in biblical days, was the ultimate indicator of disrespect. And then and only then will they kill him. But he will on the third day rise again. This is what awaits him. This is why he came. This is his earthly purpose at that time. And then you have the apostles. What occupies their mind? Having heard Jesus explain in graphic detail the beating and the humiliation and the crucifixion that he will experience, they do, as we're always inclined to do, folks, as we always want to do, 
to make an end run around the crucifixion side and get to the glory side. So James and John make their very selfish and ambitious request. Beginning in verse number 35, 35, 36, and 37. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him. And that word there, come unto him, has the suggestion in it that they are cornering him. That they're trying to get him alone. That, that they want a secret word with him. That they want to talk to him about something that they don't want overheard. They got close, is the idea. We want to whisper this in your ear. They want to take him aside. And here's their request. Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall de we desire. Now, here's an interesting point, by the way, folks. Right? Because we have apparently a number of passages. I'm just kind of off on a brief rabbit trail. We have apparently a number of passages in the New Testament that seem to lend to us the idea that we can just ask for God anything and he is happy to jump to it and, and answer anything that we want. And, and if we don't have that, it's, it's just simply a, an absence of faith on our part, that if we could muster up enough faith that God would just fall all over himself to do anything for us that we want. We never seem to get around to this passage in which Jesus goes, no, no, not doing that. Not doing that for you. What do you guys want? Well, we just want you, we'll go, we're going to ask you something and we want you to do it, whatever it is. Jesus says to them, verse 36, well, what do you want? Master, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What are you asking? What are you asking? And this is what they want. Right? Because we all know that call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So we don't want much. This is all we request. Verse 37. Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Don't want much. I don't have to have the right-hand seat. I'll take the left-hand seat. But this is what we want. They had somehow <clears throat> completely glossed over the injustice of the scribes and Pharisees, the injustice of the death sentence, the mocking, the ridicule, the rejection, the crucifixion, and they had gone right to the resurrection. How does Jesus respond to that? And one of the things to note, folks, is that Jesus responds to people's questions in a variety of ways. Sometimes when Jesus knows that people are playing with him, he responds rather harshly. And the Bible will tell us that he perceives their dishonesty. He, 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 he knows that they're just trying to trick him and trap him and find something against him. We don't have any of that here. We don't have any of the exasperation that Jesus has expressed at the disciples. What we do have in verse number 38 is Jesus' proclamation that they have absolutely no clue what they've asked. That they are asking what they are asking in ignorance. That's what he says there in verse 38. Ye know not what ye ask. You can't, and the, and the word know there is the word that means to see or to perceive. You, you guys can't see what you're asking. You think you're asking for a seat at my right hand. You don't really see, you don't really get what you want here. Then he asked them a question. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 
Can you suffer what I suffer? Can you endure what I will endure? Now we understand, folks, and I don't want to get too far into this. We understand that Jesus is using the word baptism here metaphorically. The word baptize means to dip or to be immersed. That was the that was the that was the secular usage of the word. Like when you put your clothes in the washing machine and turn the water on, or you put your dishes in the sink and fill the sink, there is an immersion. There is a totality to this. There is no part of him that is left out of this equation. He's used that language before. Luke 12, 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? So Jesus uses this metaphorical imagery of being baptized and of drinking of a cup, being completely immersed in, partaking in suffering and death. They answer in verse number 39, yes, we can. And I would suggest to you folks that they answer the question naively. That they answer the question with naively. We were out last week at our son's place. They have a small acreage on the east side of Iowa. I was just sitting there watching the menagerie of animals and began to do the count. One dog, two rabbits, three ducks, nine cats, and I don't know how many chickens. And I said to him, you have one dog, two rabbits, three ducks, you need four of something. Later that day he said to me, I have four kids. Does that work? And I thought back to when our children were small, and of course we are suburbanites. We did not have a menagerie, but we had hamsters, gerbils, parakeets, dogs. Children want puppies. Mom and dad will explain to them the price of getting a puppy. You'll have to feed it. You'll have to see that it has water. You'll have to clean up its mess in its backyard. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. We're very much in it. We really want a puppy. And then every parent knows the work it is to push the chore part up the hill. Feed the dog. There's no water in the dog's dish. Get the shovel and go in the backyard. It's that kind of an answer. And yet, folks, it is, in a very real sense, a truthful answer. There is, I would suggest to you, a naivete to the answer, but there is a reality. They're not lying, and Jesus validates what they say in verse number 39. And I would suggest to you that it is validated in two ways. Jesus said to them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized withal, ye shall be baptized. So Jesus doesn't say to them, you're lying. You don't know what you're talking about. He says, you will. And again, I would propose to you that there are two ways in which this is true. Number one, this is true positionally. And I don't want to get into all the theology of that this morning, not that it's insignificant or unimportant, but the book of Romans in particular and the book of 1 Corinthians are very helpful in in this, folks. The book of Ephesians, which tells us over and over and over and over again that believers are in Christ, that we experienced death in Christ that what he experienced is our experience. We experience it by position. But of course, that is really not the primary thing that is being explained here. These men will experience what Jesus experienced. Acts 12.1, now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Will you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Yes, we will. Jesus knows that's a very real yes. Somebody's going to chop your head off. 
Revelation 1.9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, and because I wouldn't wear a mask. <clears throat> and so they exiled me for social distancing purposes. So these men, in a very real way, knew what persecution was. So they answered that part of the question naively, but here's where the real ignorance lies. Jesus said, you don't know what you want. You don't know what you're asking. And Jesus then, in verse number 40, explains to them where their real ignorance lies. But to sit on my right hand and my, on my left hand is not mine to give. It's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Somebody is going to sit there. Somebody is going to sit. Jesus didn't say, nobody will be close to me. Jesus didn't say, you've got it all wrong. He said, you're asking of me something that is not mine to give. There is, folks, some kind of a seating arrangement in Jesus' mind. But beyond that, there's no information given. In verse number 41, we find that the other men, the ten of their companions, when they hear this, are furious. They're furious. They began to be much displeased with James and John. You can see it. Our imaginations can see this. James and John try and get Jesus away so they can pose the question. Jesus evidently responds loudly enough that they can put two and two together. And the ten are angry. Why are they angry? Well, we know the answer to that question, and that's found in Mark chapter 9, verse number 34, they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. The problem wasn't that James and John wanted to sit next to Jesus. The problem was they thought that those seats should belong to them. In verses 42 through 45, Jesus then instructs them about true greatness. Jesus called them to him. Everybody gather around. Everybody sit down. We're going to have an impromptu faculty meeting. We're going to have a staff meeting. We're going to talk about this. Everybody is going to listen to this. Class is in session. You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. Once again, folks, I point out to you, there's no exasperation on the part of Christ. There's no ridicule on the part of Christ. There's no apparent anger on the part of Christ. There is simple instruction. You guys are asking for something. You don't know what you're asking. What you're asking, what you're inquiring into, is something that works in the world. Here we have the very first, if I could put it this way, here we can have one of, maybe I wouldn't say the, but one of the very first introductions of worldliness into what will be the church. It has nothing to do with music. It has nothing to do with musical instruments. It has nothing to do with suits and neckties. It has to do with the human heart. It is the sin of selfish ambition. In the world, those who count themselves worthy to be chief exercise their authority by bringing un others under their power. This is how it's done in the world. How many people can you boss? How much power can you wield? 
We are watching this play out, folks. It's been playing out in governments from the beginning of time. It is no different in the United States of America. People love power. And they don't want to just have power in their pocket. They want to use that power by ruling other people. This is what they want. This is what they do. This is how the world works. And it works that way in government, and it works that way in business, and it works that way on the playground. And it even, folks, works that way in the church. As Paul was bidding farewell to the leaders of the church in Ephesus, this is what he said, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Come and follow me. Be on my side. We even have one man named Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence. And he wielded that preeminence in the church by denying others. We love power. We want to use that power. It is a part of the nature of sinful men. Verse number 43, but... But, but it shall not be, but so shall it not be among you. There's no place for this in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Whosoever will be great, if it is your will to be a mega Christian, here's the outlet for it, sir. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, your servant. Once again, folks, it is an amazing way of thinking because Jesus doesn't say what we need in the church is an absence of ambition. What Jesus says is, we need to redirect ambition to service. Verse 44, Whosoever of you will be the chief, whoever wants to be first. That's one of those Greek words that we know, the proton. You want to be the proton? Serve everybody. This is how we deal with in the church with the will of ambition, service, service. And we do that, verse number 45, folks, because it is the way of Christ. For even, for even, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The service that Christ rendered was the service of dying and buying us from the bondage of sin. We all know the passage, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. That's the one who has the right to make the placement. Not Christ, but the Father. 
and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The sin of selfish ambition has no place in the ministry of Christ's people. Let me just conclude this this morning with some concluding statements and some observations from the passage. Number one, this this sinful desire, the desire manifested sinfully, can be found in even the best of people. These were good men. We would not be surprised if Judas had this. But these are James and John. This is the disciple that Jesus loved. This is James, the man who would guide the early church, who would prove to be what we would probably call the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. These men are pillars. But this kind of sinful, selfish ambition can reside in the heart of even the best of people. And that desire can be so strong that it can even seek to use the suffering of others to gain for itself advantage. How were these men going to find their place at this seat? Through the death of Christ. That was really what they were contemplating. How can the death of Christ, which will lead to the glory of Christ, work to my advantage? We want never to forget, folks, that one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons that Jesus was delivered into the hands of sinful men is because they were envious of him. Even Pontius Pilate knew that. Pontius Pilate didn't know much. He didn't really know who Christ was. He didn't really recognize the divinity of Christ. He didn't recognize the authority of God. He didn't recognize the inspiration of the Scriptures, but he recognized this. Mark 15.10, he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. He knew that. He knew that the popularity of one man could create such a strong reaction that they would desire to see that man dead. This is how we can think. Number three, the church operates or should operate on a completely different standard than the world does. We do not reproduce, folks, any dimension of worldliness in the church. The church is a completely different living thing. It is a body, not a business. And the things that are used in the world that are the way things are in the world should not be the way that they are in the church. Number four, since service and not position is the key to kingdom greatness, Mark 10, 43 and 44. Since service, not position, is the key to kingdom greatness, there is no reason to worry about being recognized in this world. Sometimes even good people are frustrated that their efforts are unrewarded, that their names are not called, that their service is not appreciated. But folks, if faithfulness is the kingdom standard, and God is the one who gives out the rewards, then what does it matter if we are acknowledged by people or not? We're not doing it for the praise of men. We are doing it for the praise of our master. 
And not even Jesus found it different, verse number 45. We could go back through this, folks. I don't want to re-preach it, but the Son of Man is a theologically heavy expression, taking us back to the book of Daniel, that is clearly identifying him not as a unique human being, but as the God-man. Even God in a human body finds it this way, that service is the pathway to greatness. That sacrificial service is the pathway to greatness. Number six, selfish ambition is detrimental to the body of Christ. Paul told the Philippians, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Do nothing from that perspective or that position. But number seven, even if it weren't, even if it weren't detrimental to the body, and the book of 1 Corinthians is a book that tends to magnify the detrimental aspects of selfish ambition in the church, even if it weren't detrimental. Folks, verse number 45 is the crux of the whole thing. We are called to be like Christ. We who are saved are being shaped into His image. We are to be like Him no matter what works, if you will, in any other venue or in any other location. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. We are servants. We are servants. And there will be a time of reward, and there will be a time of commendation, and we want to labor diligently for that. But that belongs to the Lord, not to us. Let me ask you, if you would, this morning to stand. And we're going to pray. I'm going to ask Brother Brian to come and appreciate him filling in kind of a last minute. And we'll have a word of prayer. We will have our congregational invitation song. If there's any way that we can help or minister to you during that time, if you'll make yourself known, we will do all that we can. And let's pray. Father, thank you, first of all, for the great humiliation of Jesus Christ. that God would become a man and a very lowly man and a man who died. Not even for anything that he did, but for what we had done. May we be always grateful for this. And then, Father, I pray that you would clean us from any selfish ambition, any attempt to lord it over other people, to gain to ourself a following for our own glory, to allow wounded pride and hurt feelings to become bitterness to the detriment of our very own soul. God, spare us this, but may we, like Jesus Christ, be willing to serve, faithful to you. I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen.